So there was this guy named Gold Roger and he left a bunch of treasure when he died. After that, they meet a talking reindeer who's actually a doctor. But then, a giant bear man sends Luffy to an island of Amazonian women. So, an evil ghost scientist accidentally turns the son of a samurai into a dragon. Then, the Straw Hats become world famous after crashing a wedding. And that's how Luffy becomes King of the Pirates! Welcome to this episode of Some Piece. Uh, my name is Allie. And I'm Hadrian. And this is a special episode. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can probably already tell that Hadrian and I are not in our bedrooms, that we are actually touching grass. Um, but that is not the only reason that this episode is special. Uh, we also have a guest. I'm Captain Marrow. Um, so if you're not familiar uh, with, with Captain uh, Marrow, he uh, runs a Facebook page called uh, Shipwrecked with Captain Adam Marrow. Um, he's uh, also uh, releasing a book soon next month on September 19th. Yep, that's the plan. Um, and he is a local pirate historian here in Charleston, South Carolina, which is why we are doing this uh, outside today. We are currently at um, White Point Garden in Charleston, South Carolina. And you mentioned an interesting fact to me about like why this place is, is significant for pirate history. Right, so we're here in White Point Garden and essentially what happened is in 1718 there were a number of hangings here uh, of pirates who met their end at a place called the White Point. So we're here in White Point Garden, uh, and White Point Garden is here atop the battery, but back during that time period, there was a location called the White Point, which was a collection of oyster shoals that would have extended out into the harbor uh, from this point right here. And the way that pirates were always hanged back in the day, it was always at the shoreline. So all the pirates were hanged at the White Point. It was called the White Point because it was oyster shoals. You could only see them whenever uh, whenever it was at low tide. At high tide, you couldn't see the white point. And today, the white point doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it's just deteriorated by this point in time. So now all that's left is the white point garden. Uh, and not too far from here, I believe over that way, somewhere along the road, there's a memorial to the pirate Steed Bonnet. Uh, it mentions him and his crew that were hanged here along with the crew of another pirate called Richard Worley. And one of the most interesting things uh, is there were other hangings that happened before the famous ones in 1718. In 1700, there were also three pirates that were hanged here. Their names aren't mentioned, uh, but it's an interesting story because there was a hurricane that happened while the pirates were still left up hanging. And when the hurricane happened, they just got sucked off into the sky. <laughs> they, uh, they got ripped off of uh, the wooden structures and no one knows what happened to them. That's so, so funny. three pirates got freed during that hurricane. I mean, they were dead, but just sucked off into the sky. So, was there was there a reason that they were hanged by the ocean? Was it like a deterrent, or was it? Uh, it had to do with uh, law at the time. Okay. And different types of crimes were dealt with uh, differently based on what the crimes were. So, since piracy was a crime which was done at sea, piracy is specifically theft or robbery that happens while out at sea. Uh, criminals had to be dealt with as close to sea as possible. Interesting. But the executions also had to be dealt with by people that had jurisdiction over certain spots of land. So typically it would happen along the shorelines. Okay. So so it wasn't really like a like like a display of like authority. It was more so just like a legal thing. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well afterwards pirates were typically left hanging up, uh, sometimes as like a, a warning to other would be pirates. It's like if you were out at sea uh, and you were coming into the harbor and you'd have that thought lingering in your mind like man this work is pretty hard maybe i should just go the easy route and become a pirate but then you look over there and yeah there's a swinging corpse so it was, it was, it was a reminder to obey the law gotcha um so that's kind of so, so what we're doing today actually uh what has to do with one piece is that captain marrow you like anime and I you do. love pirates Obviously. but you've never seen one piece correct uh, so I have specifically avoided watching One Piece for multiple years by this point, uh, specifically so I could do an episode just like this at some point. Nice. Where I could talk with people that knew stuff about One Piece, uh, but weren't too... Too familiar with pirates. But yeah, but weren't too familiar with uh, pirate history, and I'm the opposite. And so, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to ask you um, questions about like concepts in one piece that are also taken from our real our, our, our real world and 
um, kind of see how similar or how different um, they are. Because mm -hmm. um, I'm very interested um, to see, like, I feel like from watching One Piece, I have a pretty good knowledge of pirate history at this point, just like passively. But okay. maybe Oda is way off base with his stuff. So <laughs> um, we'll start off with, I think, probably the most famous concept in One Piece, aside from the One Piece itself, which is uh, the Golden Age of Piracy. So in One Piece, the Golden Age of Piracy starts about 24 years before the series starts, and it happens because a man named Gold Roger, uh, who is the proclaimed king of the pirates, because he's the first person to circumnavigate the world, he is publicly executed. And his dying words are, if you want my treasure, you can have it. I left it all in one place. Now you just have to go find it. Mm -hmm. And because this treasure was so enormous and so mystified and, and deified, this set off uh, not only the pirates that already existed, but also a new huge wave of pirates out into the world of One Piece to find this one treasure. And uh, this, uh, and so like pirates already existed, but now like pretty much everyone is either like a pirate or a marine. There's pretty much, there's very little middle ground in this. Um, so what was the golden age of piracy like in our world? Uh, so the golden age of piracy, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it stretches from about 1650 okay. until about 1730. Uh, there are some people who argue that it's a smaller time frame. Uh, sometimes they say it's more specifically about 1690 to 1730. Okay. Uh, some people say it wraps up around 1718. So the Golden Age of Piracy, it's a, a vague catch-all term for that rough period. Um, essentially, it gets spawned into being because of the colonization of the West Indies down the Caribbean. Spain has been down there colonizing it and having everything to themselves. And when all these other nations start trying to get involved and say, like, why should we let Spain have it all for themselves? Uh, it starts off a whole entire, not decade, but uh, it starts off a whole time period of war. Just over and over, random wars pop up, wars randomly end. And in the midst of it all, you have all these pirates going after all these different ships. There were all the uh, Spanish treasure galleons, which had gotten all the gold from South America and such. And it's being exported back over to Spain. And uh, of course you have all the merchant ships that are running up and down the 13 colonies uh, here in America. So there is all that. Um, and it, it typically wraps up as pirates are slowly exterminated throughout the Caribbean. Of course, pirates still exist to this day. It's no longer the, the glamorous thing that everyone really enjoys. But uh, so there actually is something that has to do with that premise of the the execution, I have my treasure. Okay. So that is most likely inspired by Olivier Levasseur. Okay. Uh, he was a pirate who operated primarily, well, towards the end, he operated over in the Indian Ocean. He did a lot of stuff down the Caribbean as well. Uh, at one point in time, he sacked a ship, uh, you know, plundered it for all it was worth, and it was a ship that was carrying a Spanish cross back to Spain. It was known as the Fiery Cross of Goa. Okay. And it was a solid gold cross that took about three or four men, I think, to lift. I believe it was about six or seven feet tall, uh, completely studded with various gems and, you know, worth a ton of money. Uh, at some point in time, uh, his ship goes down and most of his crew get killed by natives. Uh, he ends up making it out, but by the time he gets back to uh, an island called Reunion, uh, he doesn't have it anymore. Uh, Where'd it go? <laughs> <laughs> so, here we go. So, basically, everyone assumes that he made it rich and he was no longer a pirate. Uh, but for whatever reason, he didn't seem to have all that much money. He was operating off of an island called Reunion as a, uh, working as a pilot captain, which is a person who typically operates a very small boat and assists in letting other ships uh, get into and out of the harbor because other ships don't necessarily know where the sandbars are, where the shoals are, oh, okay. oyster shoals and stuff like that. Uh, pretty much any type of port town back in the day always had pilot captains to help escort ships in and out. But at some point in time, uh, he still became tried for piracy afterwards, uh, even though for a few years he was making an honest living. And according to folklore at least, uh, whenever he was slated for execution, and he made his way up to uh, the stand before being executed. He supposedly did give off a speech and reportedly he throws out a folded up piece of paper out to the crowd. He presents it and tosses it out and it's a cryptogram 
Uh, it's a whole entire slew of a bunch of symbols that people have been trying to decode ever since. This was 1722. And uh, I, I don't recall the exact words, but he says something along the lines, uh, all my treasure exists for whoever can you know, decipher this. So supposedly he's got treasure out there. Um, again, it's kind of a, it's kind of a folklore thing. Uh, I believe mentions of the cryptogram don't show up until around the early 1900s. I believe in a French book at some point in time where they first mention it. Uh, but still, a lot of people fervently believe in it, and I believe there have been treasure hunters. I think who have died looking for it in real life. Interesting. Uh, but people assume it's somewhere over there near Reunion. Some people say it's. Uh, in the Seychelles Islands, okay, uh, which is also over there in the Indian Ocean, but that's probably what that's tied to. Okay. So this leads me to a question: Did pirates actually look for treasure, or did they just uh, take over boats and stuff and get treasure that way? I guess. So the, the typical, typical way is yes, just taking over merchant ships. Uh, it was very rare for pirates to even try to attack uh, Spanish ships that were actually loaded with treasure uh, because more often than not, pirates had smaller, more nimble boats. They couldn't survive a full-on firefight with a big Spanish galleon. Uh, so typically, they didn't even go after the treasure galleons. Uh, they kind of acted like vultures. Uh, if there was ever like a rumor that like a Spanish treasure galleon had gone down, which happens in 1715 along the... Uh, the eastern coast of Florida, which is called the Treasure Coast now because of it. There was a whole bunch of Spanish treasure galleons there that went down from a hurricane, and afterwards, everyone in the area flocked to it. There was a whole bunch of people going through and trying to attack the salvage camps and trying to get all the gold that had been lost. Uh, so more, more often than not, the cargo found on pirate ships was typical run-of-the-mill cargo. Uh, it was rum, it was uh, wine, you know, shipments of cloth, stuff that they could take to another port. Uh, and despite, you know, them not supposed to be having it, they could still sell it. So there actually is a case where pirates actually went out in search of buried treasure. And this uh, comes from an account by a man named Pierre Labat. Uh, he wrote a book when he returned back home uh, around like 1730s or so. But in the years leading up to that, he lived among French privateers and, uh, pirates on the island of Tortuga and at one point in time they had noted that there was a Spanish ship that went down on an island not far from there called uh, Anagata. It was a very small little island a whole bunch of mangrove trees. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not even sure how much beach there necessarily was to it. Uh, maybe there was more back in the day but he notes that the pirates went over there and tried to dig up treasure because initially when it went down they loaded up what they could from the treasure ship, and wherever they couldn't fit in their ship anymore, they decided to bury and come back for later. Uh, that's one of the more plausible reasons behind buried treasure, uh, is usually you would take it with you, but in a situation where you physically can't and you have to come back for it, that's a, a feasible reason to bury treasure, uh, which is a very rare thing that actually happened in pirate history is uh, factually proven tales of buried treasure. There's a lot of folklore, a lot of myth regarding it, but more often than not, yeah, you just take it all with you, or in this case, they left it. So there's a, an old map, I believe from 1776, uh, which still notes on it, I guess they never found it, it mentions that on, what is it, on Ye, on ye Anagata uh, lies freebooter treasure or something. There's a little, a little note on a 1776 map that Apparently, they never got all the treasure. Did it have an X to mark this spot? <laughs> no, not that much. Um, I, I just want to jump back very quickly to earlier when you mentioned Goa. This is very interesting because there is a Goa in One Piece. It's called the Goa Kingdom. It's uh, directly, it's in the East Blue, which is uh, one of the major four seas. And it's directly next to where the main character Luffy grew up at. Um, and in fact, it's where one of his brothers comes from. Uh, sworn brothers, they're not actually blood brothers. A guy named Sabo, who's supposed to be king, he leaves to become a pirate. Um, but the Goa Kingdom um, is like, it, it's a pretty typical like kingdom. It's like very rich and wealthy. They're next to like a trash dump. People like actually live and they treat them like garbage. Um, but it's interesting that you mentioned the Goa thing because like, if that is his inspiration for Roger, <laughs> then Luffy growing up near and in Goa is like a pretty indication. Pretty indication <laughs> that like. 
he's always meant to be Pirate King. Right. Um, which, speaking of Pirate King, um, would you say that there is, like, a real-life Pirate King? Like, if you had to assign someone to be the real-life Pirate King, do you think? So, there's there's a couple of people. I mean, there's, there's definitely some favorites that people have amidst Pirates, uh, where some people, I don't want to say idolize them, but, you know, respect how well they did during their careers. Uh, the closest person that has ever been called like King of the Pirates was a man named Henry Avery. Oh, interesting. I'm not sure if that name ever pops up. Yeah, Avery actually, I think it does. So Henry Avery, uh, he basically becomes famous because he's the pirate who made it big and got away with it. Uh, so he became an inspiration to a whole other generation of pirates following him. Uh, essentially, he plundered a whole bunch of ships, uh, got all this money, uh, sold it all. He sold all the cargo and stuff in various ports. Uh, a warrant was put out for his arrest that was issued across the world. It was known as the world's first manhunt. Interesting. And uh, despite everyone in the world being on the lookout for this man, a uh, known criminal who was known to use many aliases, uh, he got away with it. Uh, him and a whole bunch of his crew. No one knows what happened to Henry Avery and the rest of his crew, but he, he did it good. And, and that and that was, was that during the Golden Age? Or was that before? It was. Okay, during uh, this it? would have been around 16... 16- 92 I believe okay so so even in the most conservative estimate 1696 okay so like even in the most conservative estimates of of the uh, the golden age of piracy yeah. it's always still in there okay. yeah definitely Interesting. and and that gave uh, and the, his success story uh, gave inspiration to a whole new slew of pirates uh, ones that would become a bit more famous as time went on uh, such as Blackbeard and uh, Calico Jack Rackham and Charles Vane and uh, in this case Steed Bonnet and a uh, whole bunch of other pirates from like the 1710 through 1720 time period. A lot of them were inspired by the success story of Henry Avery. Nice. That, is, that is the king of the pirates. Yeah, but it's kind of like the opposite of One Piece because Roger, the king of the pirates, he didn't, he didn't get away. Like, yeah, he that's didn't true. Get away. Right, and that's, that's true. why he became. Although he did turn himself in, so like he, he could have gotten away. Right. So did you have another question, Adrian? Yeah. So you mentioned bounties. Mm-hmm. How common were bounties for pirates? Because it's a big thing in One Piece. Like whenever each pirate has a bounty, and whenever it gets updated, it's like a big deal. Okay. And some people like the power scale, like the characters based on how high their bounty is mm. but it's not really a, a measure of how powerful they are but how dangerous they are to the world government yeah. okay i mean essentially the point of the bounty was it was the you know the carrot at the end of the stick <laughs> <laughs> it was basically more often than not uh there would be proclamations uh like proclamations for apprehension okay uh which is essentially the same thing uh when you think of like I'm not sure if in the show they have, like, wanted posters or not. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. With faces and stuff. Yeah. So That's a huge deal. From, from our understanding, that is definitely, like, a little bit later of a thing. Okay. Uh, wanted posters actually have uh, artwork depictions on them. I believe that's a bit later, like, late 1700s, I think, is when they usually start showing up. So that's not necessarily Golden Age of Piracy, but uh, during the Golden Age, more often than not, it was a, a more boring looking document. Uh, they'll say like proclamation for the apprehension of so-and-so. It'll list uh, all the various crew members and stuff that people are aware of. They'll like be on the lookout for this man. Here's this list of crimes. These are his known associates. Uh, and then usually like, you know, it has a, a bounty at the bottom. And I mean, essentially it's the same thing you have today. Okay. You have like a, a bounty on a criminal. Uh, so, um, with the, these bounties, uh, was it, was there ever a time when they were like for information? Was it, was it like, was it always like wanted dead or was it like wanted dead or alive? Was it, or was it sometimes like wanted only alive? Uh, f- from my understanding, it's always dead or alive. Okay. As long as they get them, it's good. Oh, okay. <clears throat> um, I think more traditionally they actually want them alive because they actually want to give them a proper trial. Okay. Uh, even if the trials were largely one-sided against them. They still wanted to go through, through the, not through the loophole, but they wanted to go through the motions uh, and specifically to be able to make an example out of them for the public. Uh, 
which is a thing that also started happening more after the 1700s. Like, uh, so some of the more famous pirates that exist, or existed <laughs> that you've probably heard of, Steed Bonnet, Blackbeard, Charles Vane, Calico Jack, uh, Anne Bonny, Mary Reed, all of them, those all became household names because after the 1700s is when uh, newspaper reports kind of started reporting on pirates fervently and those names kind of started to become household names. Whereas a lot of the piracy that happened before 1700, a lot of the information that we get about those pirates and what they actually did comes from uh, private letters from governors back to London and in naval reports and weren't necessarily out there amidst the public. Okay, so funny that you mentioned that these became like household names. What was like the public perception on pirates? Were they like, were they heroes? People, were they despised? People kind of just like didn't really care? It largely depends on uh, the class of people that you're talking about. Uh, it's, it's very much so a situation of where you have all these, you know, rich, wealthy politician type people. Of course, to them, the pirates are all just, you know, scum and terrible. They're interrupting, uh, interrupting shipping lanes. They're disrupting cargo. Uh, certain countries really despise them because of them uh, ransacking ports and stuff. Uh, so it was very hit or miss. It depends on the year you're talking about, the nationality of the pirate, the nationality of the person, and also the social class of the person. But there were some people um, who kind of looked up to them. Okay. Some people did view them as anti-heroes. Uh, specifically after around 1724, so technically still well within the Golden Age, that is when a book comes out called A General History of the Pirates by a man named Charles Johnson, which is, which is an alias for either Daniel Defoe or Nathaniel Mist, who was a writer for uh, newspapers at the time. And it was a bestseller book. It, it sold really well across all the colonies. And it was a book that was just a compilation of all these tales about what's been happening with the pirates within like the last, you know, 50 years or so. Some of them as recent as the publishing of the book. Uh, because it talks about Blackbeard. Blackbeard dies in like 1718. Six years later, this book comes out. And the book is somewhat written from the perspective of someone who, some would argue that he idolized the pirates. Some people claim that certain ones got a worse rap than they should have in the book. So I guess it's a pretty neutral point. But in any case, some of them definitely are a little bit glorified. And this bestseller book kind of perpetuates this concept of all these pirates that maybe you hadn't heard about, maybe you haven't been keeping up with the news. But yeah, here's all these real life examples of these people going out and doing whatever they want and, you know, having uh, some semblance of freedom. They're not tied down to the Navy, uh, but, they're, but they're still out and it's doing whatever they want to do. It's crazy you mentioned freedom because that's a big theme of One Piece. Uh, it's, it's a big... Uh, it's a big primary theme of most pirate media by this point. True. It's, it's very much so pushed like, oh, seafaring, swashbuckling rogues on the open sea, no rules, <laughs> no one to answer to. And Luffy himself, like, he, one of his reasons for being a pirate, he says, is like, a pirate is uh, free. Like, he wants to be the most freest man in the world. Uh, in the, yeah, in the world. Right, and piracy seems to be a way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, what type of person would go out and want to become a pirate? Uh, typically, a person who's had enough. <laughs> uh, for the most part, uh, a lot of people that ended up being pirates uh, were ex-navy. Um, there were people that were, you know, pressed into the navy against their will. They were forced to serve aboard ships sometimes from a young age, uh, as cabin boys and such. And living conditions on naval ships, or just ships in general, is pretty crappy. Um, and when it came to naval ships, they were very strict about everything. Uh, you did get payment, but the payment was very, very small and withheld for long periods of time. Sometimes people would just continue leading you on with the promise of payment. and it's against the law to, you know, not continue working for them. So very anti-government, like... Yes. Uh, get sick of the government, go out and become a pirate. Yeah, another, 
another big surge of piracy happens around uh, 1715 or so, because around the turn of the 18th century, uh, there was Queen Anne's War or War of Spanish Succession. And bottom line is, uh, during the war, England and other nations that were participating employed a whole bunch of privateers. And privateering is another discussion in of itself. Essentially, uh, you are a pirate who has shooken hands with a specific nation. They have granted you a document, and it means that that nation doesn't care if you continue going out and doing pirate stuff as long as you don't attack their ships. There's you, people like that in one piece. Yep, you're basically siding with a nation. Other than that, all those other nations are still going to view you as a pirate because nothing has changed for them. Uh, bottom line is, you had all these people that were being you know, legally employed as privateers during the war. When the war ends, you're no longer legally employed anymore. They don't need you anymore. You're cast to the side. But you're sitting there and you have a whole entire ship full of men. Uh, for the last X amount of years, you've been sailing and attacking other ships and it's what you know how to do. Now you're all unemployed, but you still have a ship and you still know how to do it. It's against the law, but gotta make money. Exactly. So, so some people turn to it out of necessity. So did the privateer system exist outside of war or was it only during war? Usually it's only during wartime. Okay. Uh, I believe some privateers did have commissions that were instead set for a, an amount, like a time period, okay. uh, where it's like, okay, we're gonna have you as a privateer for the next five years. And then the war wraps up, uh, you know, three years into it, you still are technically protected for like the next two years. Uh, but it could cause other problems because usually the the privateering license or the commission that you have, uh, which is called a letter of mark, uh, typically it tells you, it describes to you all the different things that you can do and not be in trouble with, say, if you were an English privateer with England, and during the war, like let's just say it was a war where England was at war with France and you have a document that says you can attack French ships and we're not going to give you a problem about it. So at three years in, when that war ends and now they're on good terms with the French, they don't want you attacking the French anymore. Right. You still have the license, you still have the commission, you're still an English privateer, but they now don't want you to you know, adhere to that rule because it would start a new war potentially. It's interesting that such a like deified and like mystified, uh, I guess, career uh, throughout history is like also kind of like corporatized. Like yes. it's very like it is very much like <laughs> here's a contract. Um, we we have to respect these rules. Like it's weird that they wouldn't just be like, yeah, now that you're a pirate, like now that we're done with the war, we have no need for you. So we're just going to execute you or whatever if we catch you. Well, they don't necessarily say that, not unless you turn back to piracy. Oh. As, as soon as you commit a new act of piracy, they're like, oh, they're back at it again. This isn't wartime. Interesting. So they essentially, they essentially want to pick up pirates during war to work for them, kind of like mercenaries. Okay. And then after the war is over, they're like, all right, go on now, get. <laughs> like, we don't want to hear more pirating out of you, okay? That's so. That's that's actually not that dissimilar from the the privateerism in One Piece. So they call it the the Seven Warlords of the Sea. They are there's only ever seven at one time, although there can be less if they're like finding replacements. And they are so there's only one. This is called the world government in One Piece. So there are 170 like independent nations that form the world government, mm -hmm. but the world government is the actual governing body. And okay. they control the the navy, which is like the main police force mm -hmm. in, in the, the world. And they hire these seven warlords um, who are extremely powerful pirates to essentially do what you said. Like they don't care that they do pirate stuff. Um, it's just that they represent uh, an arm of like the military force that like if the Marines ask them to do stuff they have to do it. Do you have a question? Yeah, I want to talk about some of like the fantastical you mentioned some of the fantastical bits of One Piece, right? Like, of course different pirates in One Piece they have powers because they ate a thing called a devil fruit that gives them uh, powers but in return they sink when they touch water like they they can't swim essentially okay right? um so i wanted to know were there any myths of like pirates 
who had powers or like rumors of like a pirate who you know was as strong as 300 men or you know stuff like that uh so the only thing that comes close uh there's no there's nowhere near as any fantastical claims as that uh but there was the pirate uh william kidd so william kidd i'm not sure if that name ever pops yep. up yeah. i'm sure oh, it, it does. does it does <laughs> uh so william kidd he was a he was a privateer for england uh, and then at one point in time, he kind of succumbs to his crew, who, against his better judgment, goes along with the crew's decision to attack a ship, uh, which inadvertently uh, invalidates his letter of mark, uh, making him no longer a uh, making him no longer a privateer, but turning him into a pirate. He's he starts to uh, freak out about the situation because now all of a sudden he's a wanted man, and. He has a whole bunch of treasure now, so he starts to go around the coast and he tries to get all of his uh, his chickens in order, and he tries to hit up some of his old contacts who might be able to pull some legal sway, uh, so that whenever he does get back home to England or face some sort of trial, maybe it won't go so bad for him. Uh, leading up to that point and leading up to his capture uh, in 1699, supposedly he's he buried his treasure at a whole bunch of different places. He was the only pirate who was ever proven to have actually buried treasure. So he buried treasure on Gardner's Island. Uh, and then whenever it was found, uh, which he, he tried to bury his treasure and then he was gonna bring it up in a court case. Uh, he was gonna use its hidden location as like a bargaining point, should it ever come to it. And his treasure was dug up, but bottom line is a whole bunch of people are like, hey, that that doesn't line up with everything. There should be more. And according to him, he kept swearing up and down before he would uh, become executed. He's like, hey, there's more of it. There's more of it. I swear there's more of it down along the coast. So a whole bunch of uh, buried treasure myths start popping up about William Kidd and all the different places he could have buried it. This is the roundabout way of me finally getting to the point of saying that in some of those buried treasure myths where Kidd buried his treasure, uh, especially up in the New England coast, uh, there's a whole bunch of claims that when he did it, he made like a deal with the devil. Ah, um, devil fruit. So basically, uh, when it comes to like buried treasure stories and like pirate myth and stuff, uh, it definitely the tone of it changes as you look along the American coastline. Down here, you have a whole bunch of uh, you know buried treasure claims that are just very straightforward. Sometimes you know they're haunted by a ghost or something. But the closer you get up into the New England coast and the closer you get to like the Salem area, you start getting more uh, fantastical buried treasure myths. You start getting stuff where there's monsters guarding the treasure. You start getting into situations where Captain Kidd made a deal with the devil. Uh, and that's really where like the, the biggest like fantasy elements start coming in is the folklore of buried pirate treasure like up along the northeast coast. I wonder if Oda used that that Captain Kid myth for the, for devil, the devil fruit, fruit stuff. Fruit. That's interesting. There, there's a character. His name is uh, uh, Eustace Kid. Um, he is a pretty big player. Although I hate him as a character. I think he's boring as hell. People call him Captain Mid, and I yeah, agree. So. Uh, hot take. <laughs> um, but he also has a devil fruit power. Obviously, not the only one. There's plenty of devil fruits in the series. But that is that is an interesting because like he that name is pretty famous outside of just like. Is it, is it a physical fruit that they eat? Yes. Okay. So it's like, typically it looks like a real fruit, like a regular fruit. So like, uh, Luffy's looks like... It's right here. Yeah, that's Luffy's, okay. the gum gum fruit. Nice. Um, some of them like pears or cherries or bananas. And then they take, you take one bite out of it. It's all you need to take one bite. Um, and then you... It tastes terrible. It tastes ter- <laughs> It always tastes terrible, no matter what. Take one bite out of it, you gain the power. And, and then it's just kind of an inert fruit for a while. Um, and we also, we've seen one time where a fruit... For a while? It recharges so the the fruit returns to circulation um when they die we've seen this happen one time in the series let's see i want to talk about the crew so like in one piece in particular uh especially with luffy's crew like everyone in luffy's crew has a position for the most part zoro is a little weird he's kind of a fighter slash swordsman um is that is that common like were, were there like highly specialized members of crews or were people kind of like jacks of all trades uh typically people were very focused on the main thing that they did. Okay. I mean, when it comes down to it on a ship, you do have your run-of-the-mill crew members, uh, your various seamen that just kind of handle whatever tasks they're applied to. But when it came down to people, say, operating the cannons and stuff, they were gunners, 
uh, or master gunner, someone who's been doing it for a very long time. Uh, operating a cannon was like a very in-depth procedure uh, that usually required about four, usually about three to five people to operate a single cannon. Uh, so those people needed to know how to, to work in cohesion with each other. And, you know, there was a standard process that had to be followed. Different people had different roles assigned to them. Um, aside from that, I mean, there were some people that were only on the ship because they were good at scaling the rigging really fast and working the sails and stuff. Uh, of course, you have like a helmsman. You don't just trust that to just anyone. Uh, the same with a navigator or like a, a doctor on, on board as well. Uh, having a doctor on board was usually the most sought after thing interesting uh getting getting sick at sea and not being able to just go into a port because you wanted pirates to get the the treatment was a big problem uh so doctors were highly sought after uh surgeons and stuff on board were highly i guess sought after so a lot of the times whenever pirates would even take over another ship plunder it for all it's worth uh it's not too uncommon for them to force other people to join the crew. Uh, primarily, if you were a doctor, you were going aboard that pirate ship. Like, they're not going to leave a doctor behind. Interesting. Uh, cooks are also very uh, needed. <laughs> this is very, this is very, so far everything you said is like, what they need in one piece, like early on. And uh, so cooks are really important. Carpenters are also important. Interesting. Uh, carpenter for repairing the ship. And if you don't have a doctor, a carpenter is the next best thing you have. He's someone that knows how to work with a saw. He can oh, he can chop off gangrenous limbs and so on. Oh he, no! It's he's not in his typical job description, but if you have a doctor on board, he's the man with the saw. Oh god! So so you do have a bunch of uh, people that have very specialized jobs. Okay. Uh, you also typically have a quartermaster as well, a person who's kind of in charge of making sure the crew do what they're supposed to, okay. who follows the chain of command. The captain uh, puts out the order. The crew mat the quartermaster helps enforce it. So. Okay. There's, there's many roles. Okay, but there, but there are all there are also just like people who kind of just yeah, do basic there's, stuff. There's generic roles. Gotcha. Okay, that's that sounds a lot. I mean, like one piece, like Luffy grabs his his first few are kind of in a weird order. It's like swordsman. Uh, officially, it's swordsman, sniper, and then cook, navigator, doctor, and then from there it's it's a little funky. He picks up a shipwright at some point. He picks up a musician. He picks up eventually picks up a helmsman. That's his newest crewmate. Is a helmsman. Um, that takes like a thousand chapters. And I'm also assuming that because it's like an anime, uh, it's it's probably like a small crew as well. Yeah. A smaller yeah. cast of characters. Yes, he, he has currently ten. Uh, okay. Ten, including himself. So there were some ships uh, that were pretty small that you could you could easily crew with ten people. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes down to like a pirate ship, usually they were cram packed full of people. Oh, okay. Uh, typically, what you wanted to do was to take a small, fast boat and pack it full of as many bodies as possible, uncomfortably so. Oh, wow. Because the goal was to uh, come up alongside ships and then look at your little ship and think it's not too much of a threat, and then you have 50, 60 men storm up from underneath on, onto the top deck, all of them with guns ready to fire and clambering over uh, the gunnels of the other ship and coming aboard and being a big problem. So a lot of the times, pirate ships were just packed with crew members interesting that that explains a lot but, but that would be a problem to animate <laughs> yeah yeah there are ever so often you'll see big crews but it's very funny because we actually we're, we're, we're talking about this pretty like it's pretty early on in like chapter like a like chapter like 13 or something like that there's a um a character named gaimon who he's a pretty minor character he shows up like once or twice but he talks about like he was trapped on this island and his crew of like 200 people um, and we're like, that's insane, because, like, there's only, like, six other crews in the entirety of One Piece to get anywhere that close. Like, everyone else is, like, this very tight number of people. Especially on one ship. Usually, if there's a huge crew in One Piece, mm -hmm. they each have a different ship. Right. Yeah. Also, how big were these ships usually? Because, like, in One Piece, so, like, the current ship for, um, for the crew is called the Thousand Sunny, and I'm pretty sure it's, like... 65 meters long and like 120 meters tall like at, at the mast uh, at the tallest right. point um is that like is that huge is that standard is that like um so realistically in history that's not standard for pirates at least okay uh when it comes to pirates again they preferred small vessels okay. uh so typically uh the 
The preferred pirate vessel was called a sloop. And a sloop is basically about 26 feet long uh, and about maybe 10 to 15 feet wide. And normally that's crewed by about maybe 10 to 20 people. Okay. Uh, but pirates would probably pack it full of like 60 people. Jesus. <laughs> a 26 foot long ship. Like, like how how deep is that? Uh, like not very, I would assume, right? No. Yeah. They're, they're called shallow draft boats. Uh, basically, there was enough room down there for people to stand. Uh, how was <laughs> that even feasible? Because like, how would you get the treasure back on? I've wondered the same sometimes. Okay. Uh, so pirates did have some. Sometimes they did have bigger ships, uh, like Blackbeard's ship specifically. Uh, Blackbeard has a sh- well had a ship called the Queen Anne's Revenge, which prior to that was known as La Concorde, and it was a slaver ship out of West Africa. Okay. Uh, it was a French slaver ship, and he took that over and he reconfigured it to his own purposes. But slaver vessels, uh, they typically had a whole bunch of room down the bottom, you know, human cargo. Uh, so a mm, lot more feasible. Of course, you also need more pirates to run that ship, but... Was it... So did he, so, so did he disguise it as a slaver ship, usually? Uh, no. Oh. He, he, he blatantly changed the name of it to Queen Anne's Revenge, and, I mean, it got a reputation for itself. He only had the ship for six months, but... Oh, oh wow, that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, I guess in one piece, the, the first part of the story is only, like, technically, like, three months long, so that's not... Yeah, typically for a pirate, uh, their whole entire career, and I say career in quotations because it's not actually a career. Uh, it's not... It doesn't fit the definition. <laughs> Uh, but typically, pirates' careers lasted for roughly two years. Oh wow! Is that like because like they either died or retired quickly? Uh, yeah, it's usually die. Usually <laughs> die. Yeah, it's fair. Usually they they die or get captured and get killed. Like for the most part, there's not a happy ending to anyone's stories. That that's a funny number because that's also the the time of the time skip in One Piece is two years. So that's that's pretty funny that and like in that time, like we saw a lot of, a lot of characters basically who are really big shots in the early half mm-hmm. get subsumed into larger crews because they can't hack it um which yeah. would kind of line up with like that two-year time yeah. frame yeah with um with pirates there were some who did have a longer career of like maybe six to ten years and they're kind of people that were like on and off there were some and sometimes when i mentioned that career some of it was like as a legal privateer for a portion of it and then like did piracy for a little bit and then they you know, slipped back home and stayed there for a few years and then came back out and did a little bit more piracy. It's like, it's always broken up. I see. So it's never just like... It's never just nonstop. Gotcha. I guess that makes sense. So in One Piece, when you have a pirate ship, you have a pirate flag, right? And each crew has a pirate flag that's designed specifically for them. And it has like uh, attributes of their leader or uh, right. captain, right? It, like it's Luffy's almost always a Jolly Roger, but it's like, so like Luffy's has, it's just a Jolly Roger with a straw hat. Right. Right. Uh, is, was that common or do people like just use the, the skull and crossbones? So uh, typically when it comes down to pirates using uh, their black flags, uh, sometimes called Jolly Rogers, uh, usually that's from around 1701 going forward. Okay. So prior to that, uh, pirates did fly a plain black flag. Uh, they did fly a plain red flag sometimes. Uh, if you're a privateer, you typically fly the flag of the nation that you're currently associated with. So an English privateer is the flag of uh, the flag of England, and you know so on. Uh, so following 1701 uh, is when pirates started using memento mori imagery on their flags. Uh, Memento mori is like a Latin phrase that means uh, remember you will die. It was popular during the time period because it was on a whole bunch of paintings and jewelry and also on tombstones and stuff. It wasn't meant to be like a threatening line of dialogue either. It was supposed to, you know, live in the moment, appreciate life, death comes for us all, and... YOLO, if you will. Yeah, (laughs) it was the YOLO of the time period. And basically, uh, it was a bunch of imagery regarding uh, skeletons, hourglasses, uh, wings, uh, wilting roses, uh, you know, things that were associated with death. So at some point in time, pirates started using it, uh, which more often than not, they just threw together what they could remember from Memento Mori imagery. 
So they probably were thinking back to tombstones that they saw or a particular piece of artwork that was hung up in their family home or, or something. But in any case, uh, yeah, different pirates did fly different flags. Um, however, the default to go to was just either a skull or a skull and crossbones. Uh, not everyone had their own specialized one. Uh, and some pirates had multiple. So like uh, Bartholomew Roberts, which I assume is also a name that might pop up yeah, in one piece. Uh, Bartholomew Roberts, uh, he had, I want to say, seven different flags that he was known to fly during his, I think, four years at sea. <clears throat> so he was consistently coming up with new ideas and putting them out. <laughs> it's interesting because uh, the character who is named after him is, uh, has no ideas. He's, 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 he's a robot. He's got no thoughts in his head anymore. Uh, is like a simpleton? No, he's <laughs> like, uh, he's actually a, a really complex character. We don't know a whole lot about him. He was like being turned into like a cyborg and now post time skip, he is completely, um, he has completely has no free will whatsoever. He doesn't think anymore because he, he, he can't think anymore. And like the character that we meet, who's like currently allied with the Straw Hats in the most current arc, he says that like it's irreversible, which like really sucks. So he's a really cool character. Um, he carries a fiber. But the, he, yeah. he also has a Bible. Um, he's got a Bible theme uh, and a bear theme. So that actually goes with Bartholomew Roberts in real life as well. Okay. Uh, so Bartholomew Roberts in real life, he wore a cross necklace. Okay. Um, and he was, he proclaimed himself to be a Christian man. Uh, he specifically forbade his crew from doing a whole bunch of stuff on Sundays and demanded that his crew respect the Sabbath. Interesting. Oh. <laughs> um, and other things uh, do pop up. I know William Kidd was known to have a Bible as well. In fact, That's most... the opposite of the kid. <laughs> yeah, this, kid is, this kid is not like that. <laughs> but yeah, uh, contrary to... I don't want to say popular belief because I'm, I'm not sure if it's a popular belief or not. But most pirates during the time period were Christian men. Interesting. Uh, okay. Just because they were criminals at sea. I mean, not all of them viewed themselves as criminals. Uh, some of them you know, hoped that, you know, God would forgive them for what they've done whenever they meet their end and so on. Uh, but essentially, I mean, they they still believed whatever they believed during their upbringing. The fact that they turned to a life of crime doesn't mean that they automatically uh, deject the idea of religion. Interesting. Yeah. It's funny. Oda does include a lot of Christian imagery in, in One Piece. Um, uh, uh, Kuma is the... Uh, Bartholomew Kuma is, is, his, is his character's name. Kuma is like probably the most uh blatant of that because he, he, he like his suit is like it, it's a cross it's like black and like the white crosses it and he's got the bible um but like, like he has like a preacher look about him basically yeah yeah very much so <clears throat> and but it's also funny because like that it then implies that there's a jesus christ in the one piece in that of the world, but, like, <laughs> they don't, they don't talk that. about it they don't talk about that yeah I wonder if they'll ever... I, I, I highly doubt they'll ever talk about it. It'd be very funny. What if they introduce a pirate Jesus? <sighs> there is a character who's not a pirate. He walks a plank who gets for your crucified. Sons. So <laughs> that's... Okay, that's an interesting question. There is zero plank walking in One Piece. Is, is, was that, like, very common? Or was that, like... Is that, like... Is that, like, more like a cultural myth than in anything? I'm surprised that there's no plank walking in One Piece because of how popular it is in pirate media. But no, there was also no plank walking in real life. With real life, I believe there is one case of someone who was forced to walk the plank on a pirate ship, but that was not within the golden age of piracy. It was like in the late 1700s. Okay. And I believe it was like a, a one-off scenario. Like this was a random thing that happened. It wasn't like a, 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 a typical procedure. Interesting. That's why they made a note of it. Oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, we made a note of it because this was weird. Yeah. It's like this dude was like, hey, Make him walk the plank, and they're like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's write right. this down. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no places. Also, there are no eye patches in One Piece, or at least I don't know if there are none. But like, if there are, they're like extremely minor characters that have eye patches. Yeah, that's also surprising, which also lines up with real life. There are, there are very little. Uh, right, the first time that a pirate is depicted with an eye patch, I think, is uh, some artwork in like the 1800s. Uh, but no, no pirates that anyone has ever heard of was known to have an eye patch. Interesting. There's a there is a Spanish uh, a Spanish captain at some point a Spanish naval captain, and I believe he had an eye patch. Uh, I believe he like lost his eye to you know some some battle, and they asked him to retire. But he's like, no, I'm I'm going to keep doing this. But I think that's like the closest thing during that time period of a naval individual with an eye patch. Interesting. <clears throat> 
there, there's a whole entire thing about uh, like Mythbusters did like a whole yeah. thing about it at some point in time during 2006 or something I want to say and like the whole entire premise was like oh if you have an eye patch on you can go down below decks and then flip it up and you have one eye that's adjusted to being in the dark that was like the scientific uh, theory the, the yeah. theory behind it and like technically it did work for them in the episode but that still doesn't change the fact that like they still weren't worn back then yeah. actually <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm surprised I was, to hear they're not in One Piece. Yeah, there. Uh, Oda has said supposedly that there will be a character with an eye patch in the very last island, um, like in the last, the very, very, very final bit of One Piece. So maybe we'll come back to it. But he said like he he kept out eye patches very intentionally. Okay. Um, they're characters with one eye, like they have yes. eye clothes, but like cut open yeah. or like cut clo- yeah, yeah, but like uh, there are no characters that that have. I mean, like I say no. There's a so many characters in One Piece, I'm sure there's like at least one that has an eye patch somewhere, but like, Probably. as part of like important or na- even like important characters at all, no eye patches. Well, the peg legs. There is one. one pretty early yeah. on. Okay. Um, his name is Zef. Um, he was called Red Leg Zef or Red Shoes Zef, depending on which version you're reading. And he was called that because he's, he's a cook. And uh, his part of his motto is that he doesn't fight with his hands because. A cook's most important things are his hands, so he fights with his legs. And I don't think we've seen no. a character with a peg leg since. I, I would say that character is also inspired by Long John Silver from Treasure Island fame. Oh, okay. Uh, so when it comes to uh, pirates with peg legs in real life, I mean, again, I can't really think of one. Uh, usually whenever you became disabled, uh, that was the end of your life at sea. They don't need you on a ship that's rocking back and forth with a peg leg. You can't climb that rigging no more. Uh you can't help move the cargo around. So <clears throat> so the premise behind uh, Long John Silver and Treasure Island and stuff is he was disabled, but he was the cook. He had a, in some cases he had a peg leg, but more often than not, he has like a crutch. Okay. Uh, but bottom line is like, yeah, he can't do stuff with the crew anymore, but he can still work in the kitchen. So Long John Silver was the cook. Interesting. That must be where they came from. Yeah, Probably. It's like so specific. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a cool character. I I have a personal theory that he's actually part of Roger's crew. There's some stuff that they say that like they never follow up on. It would make sense that we actually we haven't seen we've seen a lot of Roger's crew throughout the series, the Pirate King, but we haven't seen his cook ever. And Zeph is like the first character that we meet that knows a lot about the Grand Line. I think he's so part of the That also lines up with the character of Long John Silver okay. in the fiction stories. Uh, because Long John Silver was a member of Captain Flint's crew, okay. and Captain Flint and them, they got a whole bunch of treasure, and they buried it away and hidden on some island. So Long John Silver knows where the treasure is at because he used to be in Flint's crew. Interesting. I just have, like, one more question here before we get to, like, this lightning round thing. Um, what kind of weapons did pirates have? Uh, so I see, like, your, your costume has several. Yeah. yeah. So... There we go. <laughs> uh, so the basic weapon is going to be something along the lines of a cutlass, okay. uh, which wouldn't be called a cutlass just yet during the time period. Uh, this would be called a hanger. Interesting. And that's because it hangs on your side. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, so that's a hanger. Uh, it's not a very elegant weapon uh, like you would expect from something like a rapier or something. Uh, so a, a cutlass, I'm just going to call it that because that's what people are p- commonly used to it now as. Uh, essentially, it was a hacking weapon. It was like a machete. Oh. Uh, yeah, you could sh- you could stick it through someone, but usually you just hack it at someone. Uh, on a ship, you could also use it in an emergency situation to hack like a uh, rope and stuff that had been caught up in something. Okay. Uh, it was like a very utilitarian weapon. Uh, in addition to that, uh, pirates did typically carry firearms. Uh, they'd been popularized by that time period. Uh, during the 17th century leading up to 1700 uh people usually had uh, matchlocks okay. which is still like an outdated form of uh flintlocks but essentially they had uh fuses on snap pieces that came back and a lit fuse a previously lit fuse would come forward and ignite the gunpowder in the in the firearm uh, and typically those kind of fell out of use or they came obsolete around the 1660s, 1670s. Okay. That's when uh, flintlocks became available, which was the premise of, like, you have a piece of flint which hits a striker plate and creates a spark which ignites the gunpowder instead. So during the end of the 17th, centuries, uh, 17th century, pirates had 
uh, match locks and they had flint locks and you typically had hangers, uh, but also there were other instruments that could be used as weapons in a pinch, such as belaying pins, uh, which are like wooden pins that you would find on a ship okay. that people uh, would affix the rigging to and wrap around the belaying pins temporarily. And they were just like little wooden clubs. You just beat people with them? Yeah, you could beat people down with them. <laughs> uh, so you also have, I guess since we're on video, I've also got a flintlock here. Okay. Uh, so this is a functional firearm. Oh, wow. Uh, this is a Queen Anne flintlock. Uh, so typically, this type of gun would have been used from around 1700 onwards. Uh, this would be the number one most popular style of flintlock as well uh, during the time period of 1710 through 1720. Okay during the time period of Blackbeard and Charles Vane, Steed Bonnet, Anne Bonnie, etc. Uh, because this was an experimental weapon. Uh, so the premise behind most flintlocks, I'll just go ahead and bring up the other one as well. So this one here is a replica of a 1690 Spanish Michelet lock. Okay. And it was also a, a flintlock. And the premise behind it is normally you have like a ramrod and you gotta pack the the bullet down and got to use the ramrod to get it down in there and it was a whole procedure and there's that for the camera and then you got this one here and the idea behind it was they were like let's go ahead and make a flintlock that actually had a barrel that twisted off oh, wow. and the premise was that you would carry multiple barrels pre-loaded with you and then you could fire it untwist it and screw on the next one and you're ready to shoot again Oh, wow. So that was the premise behind it. However, it was a design flaw. The area right here where it would have threaded on created a weak spot for the black powder explosion. So it was more likely uh, than any other flintlock that it might explode in your hand and blow your hand off. Uh, the other problem with it was the concept that you were handling a cylindrical object on a ship rocking back and forth. Uh... The second that you drop it, it is gone forever. You're not going to see it again. I mean, you might, but that, that's after the battle if you live. Yeah. <clears throat> so they were uh, created. They were created earlier. They were created in, uh, I believe, the 1680s initially. It just took them a long time to finally catch on, and they kept trying to hand them out to uh, the navy. They're like, "Hey, this is a new thing we designed for the navy. Don't you love it?" And the answer was, "No, we don't love this." <laughs> so around 1710 or so, they finally were like, "Okay, let's just go ahead and." make these things cheap and offer them to the public. So at that point from 1710 through 1720s, I believe all the way up until like the 1770s, uh, your generic person, if they owned a firearm, this was the go-to cheap firearm. So this is what, if, if you were a pirate and you plundered a ship and you took everything they had on board, they probably had one of these, probably had multiple of these. And so these were very common. So, so do they, so I assume like per person that typically had like one and then they had multiple barrels like you were talking about? Well, the idea was that. Uh, um, oh, but that, that wasn't really a thing. Well, well, that was the premise was they were supposed to have the barrels that screwed off. This is a functional one and they don't include the threading oh, wow. for safety reasons because historically that was a bad idea. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is safer than an actual one. Uh, but I haven't found too much information about how the multiple barrels were actually carried on a person's person. Okay. Uh, so I'm not sure about that. For the most part, I'm pretty sure they were treated like every other gun. They were like a one and done. Oh, okay. But that was the premise behind carrying multiple because you had one shot. You tip, you typically weren't going to be able to uh, pack and load a new shot before you know someone kills you. Right. So the idea was that you had a gun and you fire the shot. If you had a second gun, you pull out that one and you fire a shot, and then you resort to the cutlass. Okay. But these guns were also designed. Uh, in this specific way for other reasons as well. So this here has uh, a cap on the end with a grotesque. Oh, to hit people. Yep. Oh. <clears throat> and that's the premise is, yeah, you, you did your shot out of this, well now it's a club. Now you can just hit someone in the face with it. That's, that's <laughs> ingenious. Actually. And they have a metal caps. Uh, cheaper versions would just have a, a wooden knob down here. Okay. Uh, if you had a little bit more money to splurge on fanciness, maybe you had like a a brass cap like this one has okay. but if you were an actually wealthy person it'd probably be like a silver cap oh okay it's it's kind of just you know blinging out your weapon just a show of wealth yeah um but also it helped if you were to throw the gun when you throw the gun this helps it flip end over end right <laughs> it's got actual weight to it yeah That's so interesting. so yeah you shoot someone with it you hit someone in the face 
you throw at that dude over there, and then you pull out your sword. Where, <laughs> funny enough, I think we've only ever seen one cutlass in One Piece. Uh, it's the Pirate King, actually, and his his is a cutlass called Ace, um, which is also his son's name, although he he, didn't, he never met his son, so he probably named his son after his sword. But uh, it's a cutlass. It's, I think, the only one we've ever seen in the series. And there's a character on... Uh, he's actually the father of Luffy sniper uh, Usopp. The, the father's name is Yasop, who does use, like, flintlocks, um, and he's a great sniper. How is that name spelled? Yasop. Uh, it depends on which one you're looking at, but generally it's like uh, Y A S O P P. Okay. Or it can be like Y A S S O P. Okay. Um, and then Usopp is like U S O P P. Um, is there is there like a real life pirate with a similar name? Uh, no, there's like a piece of folklore that's associated with a uh, a folklore pirate from down in Florida called uh, Jose Gaspar, oh. and uh, there's an island off on the uh, the Gulf side of Florida called uh, Usepa Island. Oh, interesting. <clears throat> and, like, supposedly that was his, like, his supposed pirate stronghold that he had. It was Yuseppa. That would... That's how it's pronounced. It's spelled E-U-S-E-P-P-A. Yuseppa Island. Interesting. That, so, Usopp, he has a long nose. So, his name is, like, is definitely based... Uh, and also, he tells a lot of lies. Mm-hmm. So, he, his name is definitely based on, like, uh, Aesop, like, the fairy tale guy. Yeah. But also, I that might also be part of his, his yeah. name. Yeah. Because he also, he has like an alter ego where he wears a mask in one of the arcs. Mm -hmm. And the backstory behind his character that he creates is that he came from Sniper Island. So maybe that has something to do with that. Oh yeah, like he's that one island. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. that That would be interesting. (laughs) Um, So yeah, I think we're just going to jump into what I'm calling like this lightning round thing. So I'm basically, we're going to read off character names in One Piece. Uh, and, I, and I want you to see if these names sound familiar to you, um, and if if they do, like, what pirate they either are based off, or maybe, and like, you know, uh, something about that pirate. Okay. So we're start off with the first one. You've already mentioned this pirate, but uh, this one actually has three different characters, uh, uh, inspires three different characters' names. So there's Edward Newgate, Marshall D. Teach, and Thatch. Okay, so that's all Blackbeard. Yep. <laughs> Um, actually, Marshall D. Teach is called Blackbeard in the series. He's like the main antagonist of the series, okay. um, and he's like kind of the most piratey pirate we've seen. Like he, um, he's got he's got like missing teeth. He's like really gruff. He's like not really evil, but he is like domineering. Um, and he's he is very opportunistic. Yeah. Um, and he's like he's like very much like pirates like treasure. I like treasure. I like, like he's he's very. Um, yeah. So actually, funny enough, Blackbeard, if I'm not mistaken, is like pretty native to the Carolinas, right? Or at least associated with them. Uh, so there's a bunch of different theories about where he came from. Uh, the most common theory is that he comes from Bristol, England. Uh, another theory is that he comes from Jamaica. And a more recent theory by a man named Kevin Duffus, who's like a, another historian, he proposed the idea that Blackbeard is actually from Goose Creek, South Carolina. That would be cool. That would be cool, yeah. <laughs> um, the premise behind it is he believes that instead of uh, the last name of Teach, his actual last name is Beard. His name is Edward Beard. And he has the word black associated with him because of his associates, association with piracy, uh-huh. like Black Bart Roberts or Black Samuel Bellamy. Okay. Uh, so his idea was there was a Beard family that lived in Goose Creek, and there was also a Beard family that lived in Bath, North Carolina, where Black Beard was friends with the governor. And he thinks that the Beard family was friends with the governor's family, which is why when Blackbeard does stuff up in North Carolina and he interacts on friendly terms with the governor, it's because the f- family has been friends with him for a while. So that was his uh, concept of it. Uh, I'm not sure if I necessarily buy into it. It seems like it's a long stretch. But uh, regarding the last name, so the first time that Blackbeard is ever mentioned in history in like a, a naval report, uh, he's called Edward Thatch. Okay. Um, and over the course of time, and again, spelling doesn't become standardized until around 1750. Uh, so a lot of the times, whenever someone gets mentioned in a, a writing or in a paper or something, people usually write it down or pronounce it the way that they heard it. Mm-hmm. So people usually have uh, a cluster of potential last names. Uh, so with the character Blackbeard, there's Teach, Thatch, 
Tetch. Was it? There's more. <laughs> Teach, Tatch, Tetch, Thatch. Uh, there's probably like two others as well. Okay. But typically, whenever you say the word Thatch, which you mentioned is one of them, yep. and they actually pronounce it like Thatch. Yep, and, 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 it, and it's spelled like the covering on a house, like yeah. Thatch. Yep. yep, so that's how it's spelled in real life as well. Uh, however, something that most people don't know is that the H is supposed to be silent. So it's Tatch. Yep, which is why there's Tatch and Teach. Oh. Teach, teach comes from Tatch. That would make sense. But people usually spell out the word Thatch and read it like Thatching. Okay. But during that time period, that H would have been silent. That's interesting. Yeah, so in this case, so these characters are all connected. So Whitebeard is a very powerful pirate. Sorry, Edward Newgate is called Whitebeard. Um, he's a very powerful pirate. Um, he, uh, Thatch was one of his commanders, and Blackbeard was subordinate to Thatch. Uh, so so Mar Marshall D. Teach was a subordinate to Thatch. And uh, Thatch found a devil fruit that Blackbeard was like really, he really wanted. Um, and when Thatch found it, he killed Thatch and stole it. And this like cascaded into a bunch of events that kind of ended the golden age of piracy, mm -hmm. um, in one piece, like the, the currently, like it's, it's over uh, in one piece currently technically. And, um, but it's funny that they're all connected. Cause like, they're all like, they're all the same person. They're all named after the same person. Right. Uh, but they're all like very heavily connected. And, and Blackbeard, it's fitting that like Blackbeard is such an iconic pirate. And he's like the, the most pirate, the, the, pirate. Yeah, and, and, and he's the main antagonist throughout the series. He was so piratey they had to break him up into three characters. In three, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, do you want to give one? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's do Eustace Kid because you spoke about him earlier. So, yeah, so the character, character of Eustace Kid is that. So he's like a brash, like fiery character, um, red hair. His devil fruit is like magnetism, basically, mm -hmm. like Magneto. Um, and he, his character trait, yes, yeah, that he's very brash. And he's also like, he's very violent. Like his bounty is uh, pretty high in the first half of the series because um, he murdered tons of people, like civilians even. Um, so, close so, to Eustace, so, so the, the closest thing again is just going to be William Kidd because of the last name uh, I can't really say that the the character description really fits Kidd all that much historically uh, Kidd was again an English privateer and he was like a pretty successful one uh, in the late 1690s and then when he returns to privateering again uh, he kind of just lets the crew do whatever they want to do he does have uh, a brash moment though uh, like a historically known brash moment where he gets really fed up with someone on his crew and he throws a wooden bucket at them. Uh, the wooden bucket hits the man in the head and accidentally kills him. And later on, whenever he faces trial and stuff after being caught for his crimes of piracy, he's also charged for the murder of one of his crew. Uh, but that's supposed to be like his most brash thing. Technically, it was an accident. He kind of just got mad at him and chucked a bucket, but you know. He also murdered him. That is, that's interesting because Kid, like his one character, his other character trait is that he's deeply loyal to his crew. Like he's he uh, he he will he kind of gets in, into situations they shouldn't be in to protect his crew, um, which is very. Funny. And that's a contrast because in real life, all of Kid's crew hated him. Oh wow! He, he consistently has people leave his crew and not want anything to do with him anymore, <laughs> like over and over. And how long was and so how long was he a pirate for? Um. So like I said, he. He'd gone off and he'd done, he'd done uh, privateering stuff down in the Caribbean in the 1690s. Then he, I want to say he takes a brief break, uh, but then when he goes back out to do privateering again, I think it's like 1697, maybe 1698, and then 1699 is when he's captured and imprisoned. Oh, wow. Then he's in prison for like two years before he gets executed. Interesting. It'd take that long to just go ahead and kill him. It's all the paperwork. I'd say that's fair. That's how it is in these modern days. Yep. Um, what about the uh, character Diaz Drake? Or X Drake is his character, if, if people are confused who I'm talking about in this show. But Diaz Drake. Uh, any description to go with him? Oh, sure. Yeah. So he is interesting. He is technically an undercover Marine, um, posing as a captain. Um, he has like a blue navy coat because also part of his thing is that he's a he's like a double agent where he's like 
he's a, a pirate who was a former rear admiral, but he's actually still the rear admiral. Uh, so he has like a blue overcoat, like a almost like a like a red coat but blue instead. Um, I don't know if it's a tricorn, but it's like the very like it's a Captain Crunch type hat. Yeah, um, it's a bicorn. Bicorn, um, and he uh, I think he also has red hair. Funny enough, mm-hmm. um, he has he has the power that uh, t- turns him into a dinosaur. Um, but car- like temperamental wise, he's like pretty um, pretty calm, pretty. Uh, he's busy yeah. doing his secret agent. His, his, his dad, dad was the opposite. His dad was a pirate who came who became a marine. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. So description wise, uh, I'm not sure again how much this fits, uh, but he's probably named after Sir Francis Drake. Uh, Sir, that sounds right. Sir Francis Drake was a privateer for England uh, during the 16th century. Uh, he was notoriously known by the Spanish. Uh, as far as they were concerned, he was just a pirate. <clears throat> uh, just okay. big deal name. Yeah. Um, also, if he... also, he could turn into a dinosaur. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Finally, one thing that it's why the guy. Spanish hated him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Always causing problems. Uh, just destroying so many ships. <laughs> um, you got one, Adrian? Yeah, sure. Uh, what about Basil Hawkins? So there's a character in One Piece named Basil Hawkins. He has long, blonde hair. And his powers are kind of based off voodoo, where he creates dolls of people, and, like, if he attacks them, that damage kind of translates to whoever he made the doll of. So a big, like, voodoo vibe with him. Yeah. Um, He's also kind of uh, seen as one of the upstarts in this new generation of pirates. All right. Uh, So the only thing that that reminds me of, uh, basically, again, it just comes down to name. Uh, so that sounds like a combination of a pirate named uh, Basil Ringrose and also Jim Hawkins from Treasure Island. Okay. Uh, so Basil Ringrose, uh, I know the name. I would have to look back on notes about him. Okay. But he did stuff during what's called the, the Buccaneering Age during the late 1600s. And then Jim Hawkins is the protagonist of the of the novel Treasure Island. So he's like a, a kid who like gets roped into it all. I'm not sure if that plays a part or not. We actually, we actually know nothing about his backstory. He's yeah. like one of the few characters that we just know nothing about. Um, yeah. I think he like came from the North Blue, but um, it's basically it. Like he, his other thing is that like he plays with fate a lot. Like he's very much concerned with like fate, yeah. um, which plays in the, the voodoo thing. Right. Um, all right. Let, so this one you mentioned in, in, in passing, but I want to I want to talk about this person, Jewelry Bonnie. Uh, so she okay. So she is younger. Well, actually, so we actually don't know how old she is because she has the power to change her own age and the age of other people forward and backwards. So she theoretically could be like ancient. Although we we know her dad. So funny enough, her dad is a character named after uh, Roberts, uh, Bartholomew Roberts. But uh, she's like between like twenty four and twenty six somewhere in there, and she's uh, like got pink hair. Um, and she eats nonstop. That's like her thing is that like she uh, is like constantly eating. She's very brash. Um, she does not really doesn't seem like that loyal. Like I we don't know a whole lot about her crew, but they're kind of gone. Um, but that's kind of her thing is that she's like aggressive and mean tempered sometimes and eats a lot. Okay. Uh, so again, it basically boils down to the name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the name is going to be Anne Bonnie. Yeah. Uh, so okay. Anne Bonnie, uh, the brief TLDR on her was, uh, we don't really know where she came from. Uh, she was probably born in a Cork County, Ireland. Uh, so she would have been. She's popularly de- uh, depicted as a redhead. Um, okay, that's not too far <laughs> off. Uh, supposedly, uh, she moved over to Charleston, South Carolina, where she grew up with her father. Uh, who was a lawyer here at the time, and she, I don't recall what the last name, uh, McCormick, it was Anne McCormick. Uh, she meets a sailor named James Bonney yeah. and gets married to him, and they go out to Nassau in the Bahamas. Uh, from there, Anne Bonney meets uh, Jack Rackham, and at one point in time, Jack Rackham, who used to be a pirate, turns back to piracy, and when he goes back out to sea, uh, she accompanies him along with a woman named Mary Reed. Okay. Uh, 
and very short pirate career. Uh, she would have been, I believe, age 18-ish, because we don't know her exact birth date. Oh, wow. Um, but she probably was around age 18. And when they were out doing stuff on the sea, uh, their career lasted for two months before they were captured. Oh, wow. Was she, was she had that much of an impact on the history of... She was very... Um, she was very much so reported in media uh, as kind of uh, an oddity. Like, oh, look, female pirate. Oh, okay. it's, it's a woman pirate. So everywhere started pumping out uh, stories and newspaper headlines. And, like, she was, like, I don't want to say hyper-focused on, but she was used as a selling point for a second edition of A General History of the Pirates. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, basically uh, women pirate or female pirates were, I don't want to say unheard of, mm -hmm. But it was very much so a male-dominated uh, career in real life. Uh, Anne Bonny and Mary Reed were known to go like undercover, uh, dressing as men on board their ships. Interesting. Uh, however, I believe very early on, Anne Bonny switched back. She didn't try to keep the disguise up for very long. Like everyone knew the secret pretty quick. Uh, but, but yeah, I'd okay. say that's that's Bonny. Interesting. Yeah. Not nothing. Nothing like in character. But, uh... Right. But uh, definitely, definitely the name, yeah. Yeah, yes. supposedly feisty redhead. Uh, okay, that, that, that does, does that fit. Describes she is fit. very feisty, yeah. yeah. There is one big one here, and the rest of them are kind of just like smaller names. So the big one here is, we mentioned earlier, Bartholomew Cuma. Uh, sorry, Bartholomew... Oh my god, why is this hard to say? That's a cow. Uh, <laughs> Bartholomew Cuma. He is very stoic. Supposedly, because he's also a former king of a nation, supposedly when he was a king he was known to be very ruthless and uh cutthroat although his daughter jewelry bonnie says that that's not true and he was always kind okay. um is this ring any bells not necessarily okay. doesn't really ring any bells uh the only thing i can think of is when people start talking about like oh, the most most ruthless pirates uh there was a pirate named uh francois lolonais that's also that's, on here. Okay. Yeah, okay. He was, he was known for a whole bunch of stuff. He was known to, uh, he cut a man's lips off and then cooked the lips and forced him to eat them. Oh my that's god. Uh, he also cut out a man's heart at one point in time. A Spaniard, he cut his heart out and supposedly took a bite out of it in front of the rest of the Spaniards. That's crazy. Big on cutting this guy. <laughs> Which makes sense. Um... Oh, he broiled the lips. That's what it was. He didn't cook them. He broiled the lips. Ugh. Even um, worse. They didn't taste that good. I believe he's also cut off someone's ears before. God. That's violent. So, um, so he's rough. Yeah, that's, that character... And is, uh, that's not typical of pirates either. Really? Uh, they, were, they were pretty... For the most part, pirates didn't necessarily want violence to even happen. Mm -hmm. uh, the ideal uh, capture of a ship is you pull up along... You pull up, you hoist up the black flag... And hopefully they surrender. Uh, you pull up alongside, you have everyone at gunpoint, you take all their stuff, and you go on your way. You didn't lose any crew members. That's, that's a, I think that's probably the biggest thing is you don't lose your crew. Yep. Like, ideally, violence didn't have to happen. Um, like, it was the intimidation factor is what they were hoping for. That That is funny that the, the Francois person cuts a lot. because The character that his name is based on in one piece is Ronor Zoro. Who is the swords in, uh, Luffy's crew? I, I assume it has to do with Zoro. Yeah, yeah, he, he is actually for a long time. He was, he was called Zolo in the English because they didn't want to deal with uh, mm. copyright for um, for Zoro, the pirate guy. Um, but the Bar Bartholomew Cuma guy. Um, so what was so aside from like being the Christian guy? What was Black Bart uh, Roberts like? The guy he's like named after. <clears throat> uh, so. He's typically known as like one of the most successful pirates of all time. I believe he captured more than 400 ships over his, uh, again, I want to say it's a 60-year period. Um, he was the, I, I'm trying to think more about him as a person rather than his accomplishments. Okay. Um, I guess he would, the only thing that comes to mind about him off the top of my head is he was very rules-driven. Uh, he had a whole bunch of rules in place for his crew, again, respecting the Sabbath. Um, uh, he also didn't drink rum. Uh, he was specifically a tea drinker. Uh, he even, like, forbade drinking on his ship after, like, certain hours and stuff. Uh, 
he was he was an interesting pirate but he was like a pirate he made a whole bunch of money he captured a whole bunch of ships uh his his body no one knows what happened to it uh because his final request was hey if anything ever happens to me dump me off at sea i don't want my body to end up in the hands of uh you know whoever killed me mm. uh so he has like that mis- mystery element no one knows what happened to his body uh his crew threw him overboard he did get killed he got shot in the throat uh he got shot in the throat by grape shot uh which i'm not sure if that ever appears in one piece but i don't think so not really it's, it's basically small little cannonballs that are like all clustered together in a like a sack of sorts and then crammed down the end of a cannon so it turns your cannon into a shotgun mm, that's true. <clears throat> Uh, but a piece of grape shot him in the throat and killed him. Dang. Uh, but that's kind of like Kuma's... Well, not the grape shot, but the the body part is kind of like Kuma. That is true. He, he got turned into a cyborg. He didn't have use of his body. He doesn't have use of his body anymore. Yeah, I guess, I guess the One Piece version there is like what real life Bartholomew Roberts would not have wanted to have happened. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, I guess that's true because like play on that because like now yeah because now his body is in the hands of the world government. Yeah, and that's specifically what real life Roberts didn't want. Exactly. That's interesting. So maybe that's a neat little tie. Um. Also, uh, when did he die? So he said like for six years. Bartholomew Roberts. Uh, I believe that was seventeen twenty four off the top of my head okay, okay. something like that so 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 towards the very end of the golden age. right, right okay. yeah some people say that the golden age of piracy ends when he gets killed interesting uh some people say it ends in 1718 when blackbeard gets killed and steed bonnet gets killed and a handful of other like notable pirates uh 1718 is basically the end for blackbeard steed bonnet uh charles vane i want to say as well okay. uh, no that's 1720 but in any case, 1718 is when, like, all the famous ones start dropping off. Gotcha. Yeah. And the last famous uh, pirate to be hung was William Fly, and he was killed in 1730. Oh, so okay. there's some people that, like me, I justify, like, yeah, it can extend to 30. He was cool enough. Oh, okay. That's <laughs> funny. But once again, it's interesting that you say that the Great Age of Piracy or uh, Golden Age of Piracy ended with... Uh, Robert's, Robert's death, right? Because the Great Age of Piracy ends in a giant war in One Piece mm-hmm. where they reveal copies of Kuma's or Bartholomew Kuma's body as robots that the world government has created mm-hmm. to basically replace the pirates. Like, they don't need them anymore. They have this army of, like, super-powered robots based off this one guy. So... Yeah, they, yeah, they, they, they end, end... So, so like... like Kuma becomes, becomes a full-on full cyborg with, like, no will of his own at, at the same, same time that the, the Golden Age ends, just, just like, by coincidence. Um, um, but then, like, two years later, he, the introduction of, they're called, uh, Seraphim, Seraphim um, these, 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 like, these, like, uh, these robot-type things, they end the warlord system. So they, like, they kill the idea of, like, the world government relying on pirates to handle their problems. And now it's it's entirely the world government versus pirates and revolutionaries. And there's no, like, they have full control over all of it. Yeah, so uh, in real life, basically, once the Golden Age of Piracy theoretically ends, uh, for the most part, piracy kind of just stops in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Golden Age of Piracy directly, it isn't always just in reference to the Caribbean. It's the Caribbean, the Eastern Seaboard, uh, the Atlantic along West Africa, Uh, and sometimes that carries over into the Indian Ocean around Madagascar. Madagascar was a place where it was like a pirate haven. Interesting. Uh, There's an island called St. Mary's, or Isle St. Marie, uh, off the coast of Madagascar, and that was a known pirate haven as well. But basically, once the pirates get stomped out of the Caribbean, uh, piracy doesn't end. Like I said, it still happens today. As long as there's boats, it will happen. Uh, but piracy at that point kind of just transfers over to like the Indian Ocean. Oh, interesting. So, so before this, Golden Age piracy was very much. It wasn't, it wasn't really a global thing. It was very much. It, it was very much uh, again Caribbean's Eastern Seaboard, uh, slaver vessels coming off of West Africa, and that was like the primary focus of it. Interesting. There's a critique in here about capitalism and 
I'm not going to use my sociology degree this today, but hey, Golden Age Piracy starts when we start colonizing stuff. There's something in there about that. Anyway, <laughs> there's a, um, here's, so the, there's a character named Lafayette. Okay. Um, does that sound familiar at Absolutely. all? Absolutely. Okay. So that's Jean Lafitte. Okay. Oh, Lafitte. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Th th that might be his name. Yeah. Well, is it spelled with a Y? No, it's L-A-F-I-T-T-E. Okay. That's the normal spelling of Jean Lafitte. Okay. Uh, however, I've also seen his last name spelled as Lafayette. Oh. Uh, other okay. spellings. Uh, and there's also another name for him called Jean Lavique. Interesting. <laughs> uh, again, it comes down to that whole naming problem. Uh, but basically, uh, he was a pirate that operated in the early 1800s, around 1812 or so, operating out of Louisiana. And he did stuff in, like, the, the Gulf Coast, and he had to do with, like, Florida history and oh, so on. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. One, one of his, like, most famous things that he's known for is at one point in time, uh, the governor of Louisiana, he put out a, a warrant, like, for the arrest of Jean Lafitte. And he's like, hey, I'm going to give you, you know, this much money if you bring in this pirate. But then Jean Lafitte actually put out a warrant for the governor and offered double that. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny that was his like big middle finger to the governor he's like fondly like remembered for that that's really funny there so Lafitte in the story is a member of Blackbeard's crew he's like got a mime theme going on okay. um he I, I he's he speaks but like he's he like he's a thief and he he walks very silently he's got this mime theme going on um but it's funny that the bounty thing you just mentioned there is a group in one piece recently that has started issuing bounties on the marines like they're pirates okay. who issue bounties on the marines <laughs> it's fine. i was gonna say thankfully you didn't spoil too much of one piece for us the endings with your knowledge mm. oh, yeah. <laughs> you know right yeah so far it sounds like one of the only things that i kind of brought in that regard was the whole the long john silver thing but i think you guys had already come to that conclusion too yeah i also like the goa thing was like super cool in the sense that like i didn't realize that that was like that meant something in the real world. Yeah, I can't say that I have a very uh, extensive knowledge about like what the kingdom of Goa was like in real life. Okay. Uh, I just know that that piece of treasure was called the Flaming Cross of Goa, and I believe it was called that because there was a Spanish uh, mission that was going to be built there or was there that the the uh, six or seven foot tall cross was meant to go at. Interesting. Okay. It was it was like bound for a church. Interesting. Or um, or actually no it. I'm trying to recall. Uh, it might have came from a church, and the church was getting relocated. It was something along those lines. Okay. It was a cross for a church. <laughs> oh, okay, gotcha. Um, a church that's money. Yeah. <laughs> Spain had a lot of money back then. <laughs> they had all the money. Had, yeah, that's true. Um, I guess so. Now that we've gone through this, um, what is your impression of the accuracy of One Piece? Do you think it is? I will say that uh, I'm actually surprised by the amount of actual you know historical references that there are in it uh so it sounds like whoever put this together you said oda oda yeah okay ichirio oda okay it, it sounds like he did do some research before actually making the show he didn't go into it blindly uh he's got some pretty off the wall uh obscure names such as the uh basil hawkins yeah uh the basil thing is like super obscure uh, the fact that, you know, not everyone has eye patches and peg legs is a step in the direction of historical accuracy. Um, I would say, and yeah, like breaking Blackbeard into three different characters is neat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And making uh, him so iconic, yeah. And especially if the whole entire ending, well, I'm not sure ending, but the whole entire thing with Roberts and being turned into a cyborg, like if, if that was a nod to how real life Roberts didn't want that to happen to him that's also kind of like a i don't want to say a deep cut but yeah it sounds like someone did some research before they put this together that's so that's, that's good cool that's good to know i'm yeah. glad that oda is is not just like blindly throwing stuff <laughs> together and hoping it works just throwing stuff at the wall yeah and, and hope that it sounds cool but no it, it sounds like a lot of it pays homage to a whole bunch of actual history as well as fiction yeah. like there's definitely nods to treasure island in there and stuff yeah definitely yeah it, it sounds like he, he definitely uh, really loves pirates. Uh, also, like pirates are just kind of cool in general. Yeah, everyone loves pirates. Yeah, yeah. Whenever I'm like wandering down a beach 
or popping into a convenience store <laughs> or it doesn't matter where everyone's like oh my god a pirate yeah happened, everyone happened loves it today. <laughs> yeah so. yeah it happens everywhere i go like no one hates seeing a pirate yeah <laughs> um well, thank you so much for doing this with us. This has been uh, so fun. Um, super excited to, to get this out here. Um, so, like I mentioned, um, if you are not familiar uh, with, with Captain Mero, check out his Facebook page. Chip up with Captain Mero. Is it 2.0? Is that what it's called? It's 2.0 now. Okay, oh, yeah, because the other one, Facebook doesn't mess up shit. Um, uh, and then also you have a new book coming out. Yes. Uh, so... The book I've been working on for the last four and a half years, and it's titled Pirate Ghosts and Buried Treasures of the Southeast Coast, a Historical Assessment on Pirate Folklore. It covers all pirate folklore uh, regarding from the state of Florida up to Virginia's portion of Chesapeake Bay. Nice. And a follow-up book is already over halfway done to finish up the eastern seaboard up to uh, Canada's Newfoundland. Nice. The pirate folklore book? Yes. That seems like something that I would like to read. Yeah. yeah. Is it? Is it? So will there be uh, uh, links available to, to purchase it anywhere? Uh, it'll be available on Amazon. Okay, cool. Uh, that will go in the description. You guys can check that out. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a link. Yes, and it goes live the 19th? September 19th, which is Talk Like a Pirate Day. Nice, nice. Perfect. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think I think that's everything. Uh, so again, thank you so much. Of course. Um, and hopefully, we'll catch you around sometime. Yeah, yeah. it was good being here with you guys. Yes. I thank appreciate you so much. it. Yeah. See you. Bye. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that, please consider subscribing. This was so fun to do, and want to do more episodes like these in the future. But in order to do that, we need your support. Also, be sure to check out Captain Mara's book when it comes out on International Thought Like a Pirate Day, which is September 19th. It's called Pirate Ghosts and Buried Treasure of the Southeast Coast: A Historical Assessment on Pirate Folklore. See you then!